Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. It's wonderful to be here to celebrate with you this morning. 
For those of you who don't know, my name is Tyler Kaufman. It's my privilege to be the lead pastor here at Leewood United Methodist Church. And on behalf of the entire congregation, welcome to worship this morning. Whether you're here in the sanctuary or joining us online, we're glad that you're here. Uh, here at Leewood United Methodist Church, we want to honor Christ from generation to generation by welcoming and nurturing and serving people throughout the world. And there are many ways that we do that, especially here, we do that through worship with brilliant musicians and, and a wonderful congregation to bring praise to God. And what a wonderful Easter morning to do it together. There are other ways that we do this as well, uh, reaching out in the community. And I'm not going to belabor them too much other than to say we do still have spots open for a mission trip. So I hope that a few of you will reach out to me and sign up to go with us. We're going to go to Omaha. And this morning after service, uh, there are some opportunities for the kids to learn a little bit, be nurtured in their faith. And so uh, if you want to participate in the egg hunt and the crafts and things, after service, the kids can just go downstairs and everything's kind of set up for them to do that. And then they'll be led to where the egg hunt is and where all the crafts and everything are. And I just want to remind you, for all of you, those of you who do serve, we just want to say a thank you. Uh, and so you're invited next week to a luncheon after service, after Sunday school actually, uh, to just say thank you to one another. We're going to provide the main course. You bring a dessert or a side dish and just join together in celebrating what we're doing together as Leewood United Methodist Church to be the hands and the feet and the voice and the presence of Jesus in this world. And now at this time, we please join me in an attitude of prayer as we open ourselves to worship this morning. Gracious God, we thank you for the many ways that you are pouring into our lives. Especially this morning, Lord, we thank you for the reminders of Jesus and who Jesus is calling us to be. We thank you for the resurrection, the reminders of new life, and that we are called to live in new life. Help us to go forth into this world encouraged by this service today, by this reminder of the resurrection, to be your holy people. And in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand as you are able for the call to worship. This is the day. Shattered hearts are mended. Fears are replaced with joy. 
This is the day the Lord This is the day the Lord has made. Death has no fear for us. Sin has lost its power over us. God opens the tombs of our hearts to fill us with life. This is the day, Easter day. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Please remain standing for the songs of praise. Please join me in an attitude of prayer. Holy God, lover of your children, the tomb has been opened and we dance into your future. Your life has dawned on us and we surround you with our praise and lead us into joy. Jesus Christ, faithful witness, you pick open the locked doors of our hearts and come in to be with us forever. You breathe peace into our souls so we may bring healing into a troubled world. 
Holy Spirit, breath of peace, you show us our hearts so we may give love to others. You show us our hands, sending us to serve the needy. You show us your hope so we may live in your joy. God in community, holy in one who is, who was, and who is to come. Hear us as we pray the words you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Wow, it's wonderful to see everybody. Let's say hi to everybody that might be watching online. Good morning. Happy Easter. So you probably figured this out, but after the service, there's going to be an Easter egg hunt. And you're going to all go downstairs, except for the youth, who are going to stay up here with me and Mark. And you're going to go down, and there'll be crafts, and there'll be games, and then as soon as the youth know that Mr. E. Bunny has done his job, we'll let you know when it's time to go looking for eggs. But you know what? I couldn't wait. And I went Easter egg hunting this morning, and I found a few. There's, well, let's leave them here. We're going to open them in order, OK? So we're going to start with the green egg. Would somebody like to open this for me? I think I heard Timothy first. I'll get you next, OK, Ryan? So what's in that? A cross. cross. So I think the cross is in there to remind us that Jesus was willing. He willingly carried his cross to Calvary. And he did it for us. Because God loved us so much, he sent his son and, so that we can have everlasting life. And then we have a pink one. So what's in the pink one? We're going to put the green one here when you're done. You can get next. And the cross. We cut, how many are in there? There are three nails in there. So those nails remind us that Jesus was nailed to the cross. Those are pretty big nails, aren't they? You want to hold those up so people can see them? Those are pretty big nails, but I think the ones they might have used on Jesus might have been just a bit bigger. And they probably hurt. I'll take that if you don't mind. And that nailed him to the cross, where, and he suffered for us. So now, Theo, do you want to open the purple one? So what, what's in that? Joy. Joy. And it's a, as Charlie Brown would say, it's a rock. Yeah, I got a rock. So what do you think the rock reminds us of? Well, David is the one that used a rock to get Goliath, isn't he? So this reminds us, can I see the rock for a moment? So this reminds me of the stone that was in front of the tomb. And you know, the women came to the tomb on what is now Easter morning for us. It was Sunday morning for them. And they were wondering how they were going to get the stone away. And they got there, and the stone was already away from the opening of the tomb. So they expected to find the stone blocking it, but it had been rolled away. So this stone reminds us that nothing could keep Jesus in the grave. And then we have the gold egg. Oh, 
okay, Sam, you want to open that one? Of course. What's in the gold egg? The gold egg is empty. Well, it's exactly, Anna got it. It is empty, just like the tomb. The, the two women got there, the stone was whirled away, and they went into the empty tomb where they expected to find Jesus. And they thought somebody had stolen the body. But then they discovered no one stole the body. Jesus is risen. Yeah, Jesus, the time we said Jesus was risen, but now we know he is risen. He is, he, he is risen just like he said he would. Yes, Brian. Um, so I know that um, Easter is like after the day Jesus has risen, but they don't know Right. They didn't know at what point he left the tomb. They got there in the morning very early, and he wasn't there. But then they met him because they thought it was the gardener, and it was Jesus. So he's risen, and he lives with us today. And that's the message of the most important egg, the empty one. Because it reminds us that Jesus is out of the tomb, and he is with us all the time. So I have something for you that you can take to remember that Jesus is risen. I'm going to ask if you pass some that way, please. Each get one. And if you guys would each take one and pass one on, there should be plenty. Whoops, I'll take that card. And let me know. I've got a couple more in the bag. And once you have those handed out, we're going to do a quick prayer. And at the end, I'm going to say, and all the people said, and I want to hear a really loud amen. Did everybody get a little bag with a cross? Okay? If you didn't, let me know. I still have some more. Okay? So, here we go. Dear God, thank you for the gift of your Son, our risen Savior. Help us to remember that he lives with us each day, and we should spread that joyful news in how we live our lives. And all the people said? Amen. Thanks for coming up. Our next hymn, in case the screens get stuck, is number 327. We'll sing verses 1 through 4 at Melanie's direction. <laughs> Would you stand and join us? Please stand and join us.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 15. It's a story of the arrival at the empty tomb. Hear now these words of life. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they could go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they came to the tomb. They were saying to each other, who's going to roll the stone away from the entrance for us? When they looked up, they saw that the stone had already been rolled away. And it was a very large stone. (laughs) That's what it says in the Bible, not me adding emphasis. (laughs) Going into the tomb, they saw a young man in a white robe seated on the right side, and they were startled. But he said to them, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He isn't here. Look, here's the place they laid him. Go, tell his disciples, especially Peter that he is going ahead of you into Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. Overcome with terror and dread, they fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. They promptly reported all of the young man's instructions to those who were with Peter. And afterward, through the work of his disciples, Jesus sent out from east to the west the sacred and undying message of eternal salvation. Amen. After Jesus rose up early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and reported to the ones who had been with him who were mourning and weeping. But even after they heard the news, they didn't believe that Jesus was alive and that Mary had seen him. After that, he appeared in a different form to two of them who were walking along in the countryside. And when they returned, they reported to the others, but they didn't believe them. (laughs) Finally, he appeared to the eleven while they were eating. Jesus criticized their unbelief and stubbornness because they didn't believe those who saw him after he was raised up. He said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the good news to creation. Words of life for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God.
Would you all join me in an attitude of prayer? Gracious God, as the psalmist wrote so long ago, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When last we met, some members of our congregation gathered up in front of a table, performing for us the Last Supper. And each one, just as it's told to us in the scripture, asked Jesus, is it I? And then we sat in the silence of Saturday following the actions of Good Friday. And we're reminded in that time what Paul tells us in Romans, that we are all sinners, that we've all fallen short of the glory of who God wants us to be in humanity. Things kind of end on a sour note. <laughs> And it seems like all hope is lost. And it's really easy for us because we stand so far removed from the time of the event to already know that the hope is coming on Sunday. But I wonder how it felt to be the first disciples that arrived at the tomb and to see it empty. And then to hear some stranger tell you, oh, it's okay. Nothing going on here, nothing to be seen here, but to, to wonder with skepticism whether or not anything has actually changed yet, and that's what happens to Mary. She meets with an angel. Peter and John see the empty tomb and they're left to wonder. And then Mary turns around and is startled by the gardener or at least who she thinks is the gardener. And turns out, when he says, Mary, Mary, oh, Jesus, teacher! And she realizes who it is, and it turns out he's appearing to her. And all of a sudden, we get this cascading story throughout the scriptures that the message of Easter has arrived, this Simple exclamation, hallelujah, Christ is risen, to which we respond with another exclamation, yes, you know the story. And that's the heartbeat of Easter. Christ is risen. For two months now, we've been discussing and the concept of redeeming our time and the model of our Redeemer and how to get synced up with God's sacred rhythm, which is based on this eternal perspective that Christ has been victorious and overcome death and risen from the grave and calls us to rise up out of our deadened lives, to not walk around as the living dead, to not walk around as spiritual zombies, but to actually wake up and be alive and share the love of God with others. And today, we celebrate that greatest sync-up moment of all time. And many of you, I'm not calling you out here, just pointing out an observation, for many of you, this day, and maybe we add Christmas in there, are the two days a year where you sync up. For some of us, we sync up weekly, because we know we need that. For others of us, we know that we sync up at least once a year, and we do it particularly on the birth of this man, and on the second birth of this man. Because <laughs> we know how important it is to sync up to the power of the hope that's in those two moments, don't we? Again, how beautiful is that? That we see that hope and we know it and we want to experience it and feel it for ourselves. But why do so 
many of us choose Easter to be that day. There are days that I hit and miss too. Like, there are days that if you're in here long enough, you'll know, like, I'm not here. And I gotta, like, be honest with you, I don't always go to church when I'm not leading church. <laughs> but I'll tell you the day I definitely don't miss. It's this one. It's Easter Sunday. And why? Like, why is that day so important? I want to be real honest. It's really easy to come in on Easter Sunday because there are a bunch of smiling Christians with smiles on their faces and they're dressed up real nice and they're happy. At least most of us. <laughs> it's a lot easier to be in this place when we're surrounded by people that are filled with the hope of new life, isn't it? That kind of hope that is so contagious that you're greeted with that smile and you want to pass that smile along, it's like a good musical beat. Something you just got to kind of dance and jive to. You know? <laughs> the resurrection of Christ is this foundational rhythm that's supposed to be like a, something that we want to come to, that we, we want to feel, that we want to experience. Anybody notice after our second hymn that like a few of us were kind of like trying to clap and everybody was like, I'm not really sure if we were going to clap and it was kind of awkward. Like, I knew one of those times was going to come because it always comes Right? You've been at that concert or you've been at that moment where like, you really want to clap, but it was kind of a somber song, so you're not sure if you're supposed to. And so it's kind of like a... Like random claps all over the place, right? Okay. So that last song, though, you all clapped wonderfully for it, right? It was written, it was composed by our own Gavin Lent, by the way. His leader type team. Look at that. You just got to my sermon illustration before I even get there. That was a beautiful round of applause. All right. So now I want you to attempt something else. Okay, ready? You're going to try to do a unified clap. Ready? Go. Melanie, you can't participate. <laughs> all right. Everybody else. Because <laughs> she will lead you all very easily. <laughs> all right, try again. That was, that was pretty good. That was pretty close. All right, let's, let's try it one more time though, okay? Follow, follow my lead, how about? Ready? One, two, three, clap. One, two, three, clap. One, two, three, clap. Man, that was better, huh? Why was it so much easier that third time? Because we all sink to one thing, right? Not even me, we sink to a count. <laughs> There's power being able to sink to something. That's what the resurrection does for us. That's the point of following Jesus. Resurrection redefines our perception of time and purpose and gives us something to sink our lives to. So we're all headed toward the same thing. Let's read the story again. Here's Mark chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus and very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. Here's verses 3 and 4. And they're saying to one another, who's going to roll this stone away from the entrance? Like, this is a huge stone. But looking up, they saw that it already had been rolled away. Oh, okay, that's, that's weird. And where are the guards? And here's verses 5 and 6. And so they entered. And they see a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they are alarmed. And he says to them, don't, don't be alarmed, don't be alarmed. <laughs> you seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen, he is not here. What do you mean he's risen? Like, like somebody picked up him in their arms and like, I mean, what questions do they have to have going through their minds? Well, let's jump to verses nine and 10. 
So they, they leave, and then Mary tries to tell people what's gone on, so she comes back. He rose early on the first day of the week, and then Jesus appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. And he went, she went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. I want to paint a picture for you of what's going on here. So she arrives, and the words, the Greek words that are here for mourn and wept are pentheo and klaio. Pentheo can also mean lament, and Clio can also mean wailing. Like, they are mourning. Their beloved friend has just been killed. They are weeping and wailing. They are distraught, and she enters and tries to tell him, tell them that Jesus, she just saw him, and he's up and alive. I mean, how would you respond if somebody said it about your loved one? Put another way, they're deep in their feelings. Oh, but you know what? When they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, do you know how they reacted? Do you know what happened? Oh, the delight they felt? No. <laughs> it says, but when they heard that he was alive and been seen by her, they would not believe it. And then verse 12 goes on, after these things, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking in the, into the country. So some more are, are sent, and what happens in verse 13? And they went back and told the rest, but they didn't believe them either. It's got to kind of hurt, right? Like their lives have been changed. This amazing thing has happened. Yeah, had something amazing happened to you? And you try to tell people like, man, I just lost 40 pounds. Dude, I just got out of debt. Like life-changing things. And somebody's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> it, it hurts a little bit to have this life-changing experience and have nobody listen to it. And Jesus then appears to these 11 with their closed ears, unable to hear these other people whose lives have been changed. And verse 14 says this, that afterward he appeared to the 11 themselves as they were reclining at the table, and he rebuked them <laughs> for their unbelief and hardness of heart. Like, seriously, you couldn't just believe your friends? <laughs> because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. But he doesn't just give up and be like, yeah, you didn't believe them. Like, and then... Instead, he commissions them. He says, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Oftentimes, we share things, but, but some things, you know, you kind of like simply have to learn for yourself, don't you? Like somebody tells you some good news, some like great thing that's happened in your life, and it seems to be this little crack in maybe this little seed that's planted in your mind, but it needs a little bit of watering. You gotta experience a little bit of it so that you step further into it, and then you see that thing grow in your life, and you start to see the transformation that can come from it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I, I can tell you, till I'm blue in the face, how amazing it feels to be financially debt-free, how it feels to lose 40 pounds, how amazing it feels to, to live on the other side of those things. But I can't force you to take the first step to do any of those things. Each person's journey to understanding and faith is unique, and often it requires some sort of direct proof and personal encounter or experience to reach a, a point of that belief. And you know what? Jesus says, all right, and steps into that moment. Lays all these little seeds and people out of the joy of their heart share and it seems to, to crack open and make space, but then into that little space, Jesus enters and goes, okay, now let me do it in your life. Our experiences, especially those that deeply change us, often come in the form of personal encounters and revelations 
when they're truly things that blossom and help us open our hearts. And it can be really hard not to take personally when someone won't listen to the things that we've experienced and the change that we've known. But here's the thing. We're not to judge by what others do with what we share. We're judged by whether or not we share it at all. And that's all we can do. Anybody remember back in the day when there were like milk men that used to drive around from door to door and they drop off the door outside on the porch? Yeah, a few people. A few people have maybe seen this in a picture or a movie. <laughs> there's like this little crate and carton, right? And there's these like four pints, six pints of, of milk in these glass jars with these little, well, I played Pog with them when I was growing up. Anybody remember the game Pogs? They had these little like circular wood tops on them. And, and he'd take and he'd set it outside your door. And I, I imagine it must have been really frustrating to be the milkman that showed up like the next week and was like, it's spoiled. Like they're not empty glass bottles, like it's just spoiled milk. But the milkman couldn't do anything about it because <laughs> his job was just to drop off the milk at the doorstep and hope they finally used it. And it stinks to see something just kind of spoil when you know how life-changing it is. But if the milkman just got so overwhelmed by the feeling of dropping that off and never delivered milk ever again to anybody else, then nobody else gets to drink and experience the goodness of the milk he's delivering. That's how it is with good news in our lives. We just gotta drop it off and trust at some point that somebody's gonna pick it up and figure out how good it is. Being who we are and trusting Jesus to show up to others in their time is all we can do. Because you see, sometimes what we share is merely, again, the seed that makes this crack in the wall for a future experience to blossom. And each person's path to belief and transformation is not ours to control. And sometimes people are waiting to see how it plays out in our life to see if it actually made a difference. Like you may want somebody to experience something that seems so amazing. I want people to know Jesus and experience the things that I've experienced. But I also understand that sometimes I mess up and they look at my life and they're like, man, I don't know if I want to like put my faith in things that that guy put his faith in. So I get it. You get why sometimes people come slow. But all we can do is continue to try to live in light of God's love in a way that hopefully will become contagious to others because our testimonies are not simply the words we speak or the stories that we share. They are about the lives we live in whole. Each act of kindness, each word of truth, each gesture of love when inspired by God's love contributes to the collective impact of God's people on earth. We have these great examples of God's love on earth Here's a picture of a few of them. Uh, I'm going to go from right to left. There's Dietrich Bonhoeffer, stood up to the Nazis. There's Mother Teresa, worked with the poor in Calcutta. There's Henry Nouwen, who worked with uh, disabled uh, adults in the L'Arche communities in France and Canada and the United States. And then Rosa Parks, who talked about her faith being why she felt the need to stand up to injustices that she saw at the time. And all of them had unique ways to connect and to do something and to make a difference in the world. Dietrich Bonhoeffer couldn't have done what Rosa Parks did. <laughs> Henry Nouwen and Mother Teresa served in some ways similarly, but very differently at the same time. And all of them served out of this deep heart for knowing the impact of, of what the difference of their life could make in the world. And they lived these things out of Christian love. It was out of their own syncing up with the divine heartbeat that made change. But this syncing up with the divine heartbeat is not just for the spiritually elite. Romans 12, verse 1 Apostle Paul tells us, I urge you, brothers and sisters, 
in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And he goes on to say, and we're all members of the body of Christ, and each a unique part of it, called to a unique thing, to do a unique thing in this world. You don't have to be Mother Teresa and Rosa Parks and Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Henry Nouwen to make a difference in this world. You don't have to be the pillar of Leewood United Methodist Church or Church of the Resurrection or uh, any other church in this area. All you have to do is make a difference where God has planted you. Sync up with the heartbeat of God and make a difference. And it's the collective power of those individual Testimonies, each sinking up with the divine heartbeat that creates a symphony of faith and action that greatly amplifies the good that is put into the world. In order for that to happen, though, in more places, we're invited to be a member of the body of Christ, and it looks a little bit different. You might say that we transpose the life song of Christ into our own lives. Does anybody remember these CDs? It's a CD with like three keys. It's like a karaoke CD. And back in like the 90s and early 2000s, they were super popular. You'd put them into like a boom box and you'd play it and then you could sing a popular song, but you could sing it in a key that you could actually sing. So this is the song, My Jesus, like, my Jesus, my savior. People remember that song a little bit? But if you couldn't sing like in that octave, like maybe you needed to sing, my Jesus, my savior. And you could sing down there. And if you really need to sing, my Jesus, then you could sing up there. <laughs> now, if we put all those songs together at the exact same time, it would sound pretty funny. <laughs> but the beautiful thing is that when we're singing to Jesus, we can each take these things the way that a cover band takes a Beatles song over there and another cover band takes a Beatles song over there and does it a little bit different and it, it, can, it can reach and touch different lives in, in different places. We're called to transpose the life song of Jesus into our own lives, but there's a couple of laws that come along with this. I want to make you very aware of them this morning. The first one is that you have to look at what Jesus did and then adjust it to fit your own context. Look, I am a white dude living in Johnson County, serving at Leewood United Methodist Church, and the way that I live out my context of how I'm supposed to share the love with Jesus looks very different than somebody that isn't white living in urban Kansas City or over in San Francisco or down in Florida or up in Maine or over in England, in Africa, in South Korea, in China, in Russia. We each have to play to our unique context of where God has called us to sing our life song. But here's the second one, and I feel like this is equally important, and people miss this way too often. Here's the second law of transposition. Jesus was and is the Savior, and I am not. <laughs> It is so easy for me to tell people like what they should and shouldn't do and think that it worked for me so it's going to work for them. But guess what? Like I'm not the savior. <laughs> It'd be really easy to take so many things on when we're called to be the hands and the feet and the voice and the presence of Jesus. But we gotta remember we're called to be a member of that body and not the head of it. <laughs> we don't do the saving ourselves. We point to the Savior, and then we participate in the healing and saving work that Jesus does. It's not my job to save the world. It's my job to live as one who is saved and share the love that I've received with others. Because the goal is not for everybody to sink to Tyler so that we sink to Jesus. The goal is for everybody to sink to Jesus and thereby be drawn closer to one another as we're drawn closer to God. Jesus is to be the one to whom we sink the beat of our lives. And when that happens, we all grow closer in love as we move closer to the one 
who is love. So would whatever ways and whatever frequency at whatever times it happens, sink to Jesus as a way of life. Not because it's part of a checklist you're told to mark off. So let us live in love and the resurrection power of Christ by sharing our own each unique gifts with the world that God has granted to us. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, I thank you for the many ways that you are moving in our lives. We thank you for the Savior, Jesus, for sacrifice for us, for his resurrection and calling us to new life. Help us so to live into that new life to which we have been called. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
gracious God, we thank you for the many different talents, gifts that you have provided for us. Please help us to use them in your service to share your love with the world. Amen. I danced in the morning when the world was begun And I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun And I came down from heaven and I danced on the earth And Bethlehem I had my bed Dance then wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you this time, let us join in ascending blessing by reciting what we already did at the beginning as we leave this place to carry out light, Christ's light with us. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Happy Easter.